My name is Sanjay Gupta. I am a consultant cardiologist in York. Today's video is on the subject of the management of chronic disease with a focus on heart failure. Now, I wanted to tell you a little bit about a patient that I met a few years ago that I will always remember. And uh, this patient will illustrate the current problem with management of chronic disease. And then hopefully I'll be able to talk you through what I feel is the way uh, chronic disease should be managed. Okay, so a few years ago, a lady in her 50s contacted me. Now, this lady was um, generally very fit and well. She'd actually never been to see a doctor before. Uh, she was in a very prestigious, high-powered post. Uh, she was happily married. She had a daughter in Australia. She had a wonderful social life where she had lots of girlfriends and she enjoyed going out um, and partying with them and also hiking. And around about Christmas time, the year, two years before she actually contacted me, she developed a flu-like illness. And after that, she started noticing that she was getting breathless on very modest levels of exertion. This caused her some concern, so she contacted her GP. But unfortunately, she couldn't even get an appointment for three weeks. Eventually, she managed to go and see the GP who examined her and suggested that she may have asthma and gave her some inhalers. She was asked to go back in four weeks to see how she was feeling. Unfortunately, though, she felt no better and actually felt worse. So she went back in four weeks and this time she saw another doctor uh, who, su who suggested that maybe she should stop the inhalers and felt that it would be a good idea to investigate her by a chest x-ray and some blood tests. And after a few days later, she got a phone call calling her back to the surgery where she saw a third doctor who then told her that her chest x-ray and blood test suggested that she may have heart failure as a cause of her symptoms and that she needed to see a cardiologist urgently. This poor woman was completely stunned when she heard this and even before she could collect her thoughts and ask the doctor any questions, she was shown the door with the advice that she would hear from the cardiologists very soon. This poor woman went home completely shell-shocked, with her life turned upside down in an instant. As she hadn't even had a chance to ask any questions, the first thing she did was she went home and looked up heart failure on the internet. And when she started reading about heart failure, her heart sank because she read about all the horrible things that could happen with heart failure. Finally, this lady got an appointment to see a cardiologist who then did confirm that she did indeed have moderate heart failure and that she needed to start some medications as soon as possible and that he would arrange for a heart failure nurse to see her. This took another four weeks and then the nurse came round uh, to see her and asked her how she was and uh, this particular patient was feeling a bit better but not uh, by no means was she normal. In any case, the nurse increased her medication and said, look, I'm going to come back and review you again in eight weeks. In the meanwhile, the patient continued to remain completely confused about why her medications were being increased. And she started noticing that she was getting more tired. She was not sleeping well. She was getting headaches. And she was very unsure as to whether this was because of her underlying condition or a side effect of her medications or whether she was actually developing anxiety. So she went to see her GP again, and this time she saw someone else who said that he was limited with what he could give her because he was worried about how any additional medications that he may give her could affect her heart. So unfortunately, her anxiety about all this progressed and it started affecting the relationship she had with her husband. She stopped going out with her friends because she was told that, you know, alcohol is bad, so you can't drink alcohol. And her friends would, you know, they used to enjoy going and having a drink, just, you know, just normal social, socially. She stopped hiking because she'd been told to avoid any undue exertion. As she started spiraling downwards, it started affecting her employment. She was desperate to go and see her daughter, but because of her diagnosis, she was worried about traveling in a plane all the way to Australia, and her travel insurance became unaffordable. And then she started finding that because she was so down, everything, 
in her life was being taken away from her, she started comfort eating, piling on weight, which knocked her confidence even more and made everything so much worse. Finally, she decided to go and see a famous professor of cardiology privately. And uh, she told me that when she went to see this guy in Harley Street, he spent no more than 10 minutes with her. He looked at her notes, looked at her medications, told her that she was optimally managed and nothing else was needed and discharged her. It was soon after this incident that she contacted me. And in this video, I wanted to talk to you about what has happened since, how we managed her and where she is now. So this lady's heartbreaking story shows the problem with modern day medicine. This poor woman had seen a multitude of different nameless faces over a course of 18 months and she was actually in a far worse position both physically and mentally than she was when she had started. She was now on eight tablets every day when she had never taken a tablet in her life before this. And unfortunately, she didn't even know whether these, what these medications were doing for her. Most disappointingly, despite all these encounters with healthcare professionals, she had failed to establish any kind of rapport with anyone because she was seeing different people every time and she felt completely lost and felt she was on her own. Now, this is far from optimal management. I disagree with the professor that she saw. This is not optimal management. This is the kind of care that enfeebles a patient, that enslaves a patient and makes the patient worse rather than better. So today I wanted to chat to you about what I feel optimal care should be uh, and how it should be delivered uh, and how care when administered properly can actually empower and liberate the patient rather than contribute to what happened to this particular woman. The principles here um, that I'm going to be discussing here can be applied to all chronic disease, but because I'm a cardiologist, I see heart failure more so, I'm going to try and illustrate some of the points with heart failure management. Now, the diagnosis of any chronic long-term disease can be a traumatic and life-changing experience for a patient. As there is often no easy cure in sight, the patient often finds themselves thrown into a chaotic new world where he or she has to start making sense of medical jargon, uh, learning to navigate through misinformation on the internet. And this can be proved to be a confusing, scary, and lonely journey for the patient. When it comes to management, the most important first principle is that the doctor should understand that the patient is an individual person and not just a number or just a body. And therefore, all management has to be based around that particular patient's wishes and that particular patient's values and that particular patient's physical, psychological, spiritual and social needs. Secondly, all management should be ensconced in kindness, patience, connection and good communication. If we're unable to build a relationship of trust with the patient, then we are going to fail in achieving the best outcome for that patient. And this is why engagement and empathy are so essential. In this setting, healthcare professionals should never be afraid to show their own vulnerabilities to patients to build connection. This is not abandoning professionalism. This is embracing humanity. Thirdly, we need to provide the patient with holistic care and therefore we need to build a team consisting of healthcare professionals from different disciplines who can address that individual patient's needs by talking to them but also talking to each other in a language that is consistent and understandable to the patient. It is also important that the same healthcare professionals deal with the patient every time. How can you possibly build rapport and trust if you never see the same doctor more than once? The next step is education. 
we need to educate the patient on the condition in jargon-free and reassuring language, especially with regards to what risk factors and lifestyle choices may have led to the development of the condition and on practical ways to modify those risk factors as aggressively as possible. Similarly, we want to empower the patient to identify their own triggers which could make their symptoms worse and where possible avoid them. So unfortunately what happens now is, you know, we have these kind of just general things. Oh, you shouldn't eat this. You shouldn't have coffee. You shouldn't do this. Actually, what we should be saying is look out. If you find that this makes your symptoms worse, then it's probably better to avoid it. And the next step is to talk about treatments. And I think these, I, I would like to break them down into four categories and I think they should all be delivered simultaneously and they're complementary treatments rather than uh, one or the other. So the four categories are pharmacotherapy, tablets, injections, etc., procedures, surgery, uh, rehabilitative therapy, and finally psychological therapies. And I'll go through each of them step by step. So in terms of pharmacological treatments, these can be divided into two groups. Medications that improve quality of life, usually by relieving symptoms, and medications that can prolong life. Now, medications that improve quality of life and heart failure, for example, include diuretics. Diuretics do not prolong life, but they can ease symptoms. They get rid of fluid, extra fluid buildup that in, results in the patient breathing better, uh, leg swelling gets down, etc. If a medication that has been given to improve quality of life but paradoxically worsens quality of life by giving the patient severe side effects, then there is absolutely no reason for the patient to take it. Other medications that can improve quality of life include painkillers, palliative medications, etc. Then there are medications that prolong life. Now, unfortunately, the patient will never be able to measure his own length of life, and therefore the life-prolonging effects of a medication can only be relied upon based on data that is accrued from population-based studies, ideally in people who most resemble that patient. In heart failure, there are four types of medications that have been shown to improve prognosis, and ideally, you want the patient to be taking a little bit of all four different types because they work synergistically. These include uh, ACE inhibitors. Uh, these are medications that end with ill, ramipril, enalapril, lisinopril. Now they've been replaced by another medication called Entresto. Then the second group is beta blockers. Third group are mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists like spironolactone, eplerinone, etc. And finally, now we have a new class of anti-diabetic medications called SGLT2 inhibitors. And all these medications have been shown to improve prognosis. And ideally, wherever possible, the patient should take a little of each of them together rather than lots of one and none of the other. Uh, and it was important for me to explain this to the patient so that she could understand which of her medications, all these tablets she were taking, which of them was actually there to make her feel better and which of them were there to allow her to improve, you know, to allow the heart to heal, to improve her prognosis. And by her understanding that, understanding why she was taking the medications, she felt a lot more comfortable about taking the medications. Similarly, there are procedures or surgery that can sometimes also be helpful both in terms of improving quality of life or even life prolongation. So in heart failure, one procedure that can improve quality of life is the implantation of a special kind of pacemaker called a biventricular pacemaker. Now, when the heart is weak, it can become dyssynchronous. What I mean by dyssynchronous is a weak heart is a flabby heart. So when the heart is trying to contract, different parts of the heart contract at different times and that does not make for a very um, efficient contraction, effective contraction. So one part may contract before another and therefore all the blood is not going out together. And therefore implanting a pacemaker which can make all the different parts of the heart contract together can substantially increase the amount of blood that comes out of the heart with each heartbeat. And this then translates into the patient's quality of life improving, their exercise capacity improving, etc. 
Interventions that may prolong life in uh, heart failure include uh, implantation of something called a defibrillator. Now, patients with a very weak heart may be prone to life-threatening heart rhythm disturbances, and therefore a defibrillator, uh, is, which has been implanted within the chest, can detect uh, a life-threatening disturbance and deliver a life-saving shock and thereby prolong life. There are other interventions as well that one can uh, offer patients with heart failure, particularly if the patient is deteriorating. These are known as left ventricular assist devices. These are devices which can mechanically augment the pumping function of the heart. And in the most severe cases, there is also the possibility of considering heart transplantation, which whilst a huge undertaking can completely change a person's life. And it is worth knowing now that patients who may not have been deemed suitable for heart transplantation once upon a time may now actually be candidates for heart transplantation because the laws around organ donation have changed. So in the past, you had to opt into organ donation. Now you have to opt out of organ donation. And that means that more organs will um, be available for patients who need them. Another thing, that, another intervention that can help uh, is heart bypass operations and stents can help, particularly if the heart has been, is weak or failing because of a lack of adequate blood, in which case opening up the blood vessels can allow more blood to get to the weakened areas and the muscle function can improve. So again, it was important for this lady to tell this lady that, look, you know, just because you can't, it, it, the medications are there and you can take them, but if you can't take the medications or if despite that you're struggling, we can still offer you all these things as well. And that comforted her greatly to know that, that there were options, there were additional options. The next step, the next category I wanted to talk about was rehabilitative therapy. So physiotherapy, conditioning exercises, mindfulness, yoga. These can be extremely helpful in terms of improving quality of life from all forms of chronic disease. Chronic disease of any sort can lead to muscle weakness, increased frailty, which then makes the underlying condition even worse. And by encouraging patients to undertake regular moderate exercise will definitely improve both physical health and mental health. So in this lady's case, I was uh, able to happily tell her that there was no reason why she couldn't go hiking with her friends as long as she did it gradually. Because not only would it be good for her mind and her confidence, but it would actually also be really, really good for her heart. So that boosted her that she could actually do those things that she enjoyed. Uh, and then there was psychological therapy. So, you know, I think physical health and mental health are very closely aligned. And if we want to get patients physically well, we cannot ignore any mental unhappiness. My patient had been imprisoned by fear, and I wanted her to know that fear wasn't stopping her from dying. It was actually stopping her from living. And I encouraged her over the time that we kept communicating and uh, consulting. Uh, I encouraged her to speak to me about her fears. And she told me that, was she, that she was fearful of intimacy with her husband. And she was fearful of traveling to see her daughter. And she was even fearful ha of having the occasional drink uh, with her friends. And I was able to tell her that these were all unfounded fears. There was no reason from a heart perspective for her to fear intimacy with her partner. There was no evidence at all. Um, uh, there is no evidence at all that this is harmful. And in fact, it is actually probably good for mental and therefore physical health. Similarly, from my perspective, there was absolutely no reason why, just because she had moderate heart failure, that she couldn't go and see her daughter if she wanted to. As again, there is no evidence that traveling at high altitude in a pressurized cabin has a deleterious effect on the heart. There have been studies looking at that. People do not come to harm because they're in an aeroplane. Finally, I was even able to tell her that there was no reason why she couldn't have the occasional small drink with her friends once in a while, as long as she did it sensibly. And this suddenly boosted her confidence. And she said, gosh, you know, at least I have something to look forward to. At least I have something that I can do. The next step in management was regular follow-up and seeing how she was progressing. And it was vital, it is vital that the patient sees the same doctor so that both the doctor and the patient can pick up and build on all the constructive work that was done at the last visit. 
Finally, I think there's, there is a really important part of management of chronic disease that is not really emphasized. And I think it, there is so much value um, from the learning that is gained from such an experience. For the patient, a diagnosis of chronic um, disease should teach the patient about instilling gratitude in their lives. You know, whenever I've had patients who do this, their quality of lives have improved. And therefore, I think gratitude has to be an essential component of our journey towards healing. And for the doctor, I think the learning is gained through reflection. Every patient, every encounter is an opportunity for the doctor to reflect and use that reflection to better himself or better herself. That reflection should not be about working out whether as a doctor one did anything wrong, but more importantly, could one have done things even better? Could we have been kinder? Could we have been more empathic? Could we have been more human? This to me is what ideal management and care should be. This is what will allow us to stop enslaving patients, but instead, of, but instead empowering them, liberating them. This is how we become healers rather than pill peddlers. Now, I'm really delighted to tell you that this particular lady that I was talking to you about is much better. In fact, she recently sent me a picture of herself with a big beaming smile on her face and her newly born grandson in her arms. She had finally made it to Australia with her husband to see her beloved daughter who was going to have a baby. So, you know, all ended well. She's well uh, after all that. I wanted to leave you with a final thought, you know, um, and many people who listen to what I'm saying would say that, yes, that is ideal, but in the real world, we simply don't have the ability to do this with the number of patients we have. Um, I'm going to share a story with you, and I'm sure you've heard it before, but I find it particularly poignant at this time. Um, one day, an old man was walking along a beach that was littered with thousands of starfish that had been washed ashore by the high tide. As he walked, he came upon a young boy who was eagerly throwing the starfish back into the ocean, one by one. Puzzled, the man looked at the boy and asked what he was doing. Without looking up from his task, the boy simply replied, I'm saving these starfish, sir. The old man chuckled aloud, son, there are thousands of starfish and only one of you. What difference can you make? The boy picked up a starfish, gently tossed it into the water and turned to the man, said, it, it made a difference to that one. And therefore, it is only by starting to make a difference to one person will we eventually be able to make a difference to society at large. I hope you found this useful. And once again, you will never truly know what you do for me. I really appreciate everything you do for me. All the best. Take care.